Saturday, December 20th, 2014. A man by the name of Belinga Kalala suspected his wife of cheating on him. Soon after his suspicions, his wife told him that her stepmother died and that she has to travel out of the country to attend a funeral. So when she traveled out of town, he decided to do something that will haunt her memories forever. When police first answered a 911 call about an unresponsive man lying in his yard in Trenton, South Carolina, it seemed like a simple tragedy. Authorities found Joseph McKinnon dead of a heart attack, but then they also found the body of his girlfriend, Patricia Dent, in a nearby pit. McKinnon, police had realized, had died while trying to bury his girlfriend's body. Evidence gathered at the scene, along with statements from witnesses, aided investigators to build a timeline, leading them to believe that Mr. McKinnon attacked Ms. Dent while inside her home. Their statement added, Mr. McKinnon then bound her and wrapped her in trash bags before putting her in a previously dug pit. The pit was then partially filled in by Mr. McKinnon. While covering the pit, Mr. McKinnon had a cardiac event causing his death. There was no trauma to his body and he seemed to have died of natural causes. However, the investigators had a hard time finding his significant other. After searching the home that McKinnon and Dent shared, police reached out to Dent's colleagues at the Mount Village Golf Club in North Augusta. Her co-worker said that Dent had uncharacteristically missed work that morning and that she hadn't responded to any messages. Police then searched the premises. After finding blood inside McKinnon and Dent's home, they returned to the garden where McKinnon had died while filling a large pit. A neighbor had told police that McKinnon had dug the pit for a new water feature, but police found something else inside. They got down in the pit and started digging around. They uncovered it enough that they found black garbage bags. Inside the bags, he said, police found the body of bound and bruised Patricia Dent. According to an autopsy confirmed what police had suspected already. McKinnon had died of cardiac arrest. Dent had been strangled. Police believe that after hitting and choking Dent, McKinnon had bound her with tape and then he wrapped her body in large garbage bags. He brought her to their garden where he suffered a heart attack as he tried to bury her. He was feverishly covering the pit. And so we just kind of put things together, Roland said, who was the detective. He attacked her, killed her, and then put her in a pit and he just died covering her up. Pretty much that case is over, but the tragedy of Patricia Dent's murder has just started. Her twin sister described her devastation about Dent's death in her post on Facebook. She says, what am I going to do without her? I'm broken. I love my twin with everything. No one saw this coming and whoever met her liked her. She was just full of energy and still working at the age of 65. She also said that it's a nightmare and she wants to wake up. It just feels like a dream. But this is reality in life and a big part of her is gone. Now, she's going to have to just live with it. Police noted that McKinnon and Dent had no known history of domestic violence and that the police had never been called before to their Trenton residence before. Indeed, it seems that if Joseph McKinnon hadn't suffered a heart attack while burying Patricia Dent, his girlfriend may have simply vanished. New information now on the investigation into the bodies found in the backyard of an Edgefield County home over the weekend. Here's Nikita Dennis with the latest. The Edgefield County Sheriff say evidence shows Joseph McKinnon strangled Patricia Dent inside the home and was burying her in the backyard when he died of a heart attack. They say they discovered Joseph Keenan's body first before finding Dent's body in the backyard pit. Neighbors in Trent, South Carolina are left with plenty of questions after Edgefield County Sheriff's deputy responded to Tanglewood Drive on Saturday and discovered the two bodies. Dunhoundsmith, who lives just a block up from where the bodies were discovered, she said she was concerned and she didn't know there was danger until after those bodies were discovered. We have no idea. 
And that's what we're asking about. At least let us know that it's something they have in control or don't have in control. And do we have to make sure everything's locked up tight, you know, watch our dogs or our animals. We got a farmer back there too, you know, it's, it's scary. In Edgefield County, I'm Nikita Dennis, WJBF News Channel 6. In January 2015, Noella Rocundo of Melbourne, Australia, flew into the African country of Burundi for her stepmother's funeral. Little did she know that when she returned home a month later, she'd be attending her own funeral. What happened in between is a nightmare that still haunts her. Rocundo's husband, Balinga Kalala, wrongly suspected her of infidelity, so he hired three hitmen to murder her while she was in her home country. The men kidnapped her but they refused to kill her. And they even ultimately helped her prove Kalala's guilt. And when Noella Rocundo returned to Australia, she gave Kalala the fright of his life. When she showed up at their home on the very day of her funeral, Noella Rocundo immigrated to Australia from Burundi with her five children in 2004. There she met Balinga Kalala a Congolese refugee who helped translate English to Swahili for Wakundo at the resettlement agency where they both worked. Over the next decade, Wakundo and Kalala would settle in Melbourne, get married, and have three children together. But by 2014, Kalala became convinced that Wakundo was cheating on him. When Wakundo flew back to Burundi to attend her stepmother's funeral in January of 2015, Kalala decided to get revenge on his wife's imagined wrongs. On February 17, 2015, the evening after her stepmother's memorial, Rakundo was tired and stressed. She was emotionally drained from the funeral and the African heat was stifling even indoors. As she tried to get some rest, Kalala called her to check on her. He consoled her, then he told her just to step outside to get some fresh air she decided to take his advice. What she said is, she didn't think anything of it. She just thought that he cared about her and that he was worried about her. As soon as she left the hotel, a man holding a gun approached her. She said she opened the gate and saw a man coming toward her. Then he pointed the gun at her. He told her, don't scream, and if you scream, he'll shoot her. And they might catch him, but she'll be dead. Mercundo did what he told her. The gunman ushered her into a car, where two other strangers were just waiting for her. She says, I was sitting between two men, she remembered. One had a small gun and one had a long gun. And the men say to the driver, pass us a scarf. They covered Rakondo's face with the fabric and drove off. She says, after that, I didn't say anything. I was taken somewhere, 30 to 40 minutes away. Then I hear the car stop. The gunman pushed Noella Rocondo into a building and tied her to a chair. She heard one of the kidnappers remark to another, go call the boss. They began asking her what she'd done that would make a man want to kill her. She replied, which man? Because I don't have any problems with anybody. So they said, let me call who paid us to kill you. One gunman taunted her. He picked up the phone and he told the man on the other end of the line, we already have her. Then Rakundo heard her husband's voice reply, just kill her. Did they describe to Kalala where they were going to dump her body? Noella Rakundo passed out. Noella Rakundo regained consciousness as the hitman ended the call with her husband. She says, I said to myself, I was already dead. There's nothing I can do to save me. She recalled. However, something entirely unexpected happened. The kidnappers told her, we're not going to kill you. We don't kill women and children. But the gang's leader still wanted to extort money from Kalala, so they informed Rakundo's husband that the murder fee had increased. It now required an additional $3,400 in Australian dollars to complete the hit job, bringing their total payment to nearly $10,000. They held Rakondo captive for two days before releasing her on the side of a road. They supplied her with incriminating evidence, including a memory card with recorded phone conversations 
and Western Union money transfer receipts that provided Kalala the plan hit. They told her that they'll give her 80 hours to leave the country. And they said, your husband is serious. Maybe we can spare your life, but there's other people that won't do the same thing. All the while, Kalala believed that his wife was to be dead by his request. He told family and friends that Wakanda was killed in a tragic accident while she was away. The African community in Melbourne provided spiritual and financial support to Kalala, but Noella Wakanda was indeed alive. Though it was in the middle of the night in Australia, Wakanda immediately called her pastor back in Melbourne to ask for help. She also contacted the Kenyan and Belgian embassies for assistance returning to Australia. She arrived back in Melbourne February 22, 2015, and went straight home to confront Kalala. At 7.30 p.m., she pulled up and she saw Kalala escorting guests to their cars following the memorial service he had hosted for his supposedly dead wife. After the guests left, Kondo emerged. She stared at her husband, who was understandably perplexed, and he was terrified. She said that he didn't believe it. Then he starts walking toward her slowly. While he was walking, it looked like he was walking on broken glass. He kept talking to himself. When he reached her, he touched her on the shoulder and then he jumped. Then he did it again and he jumped again. Then he asked her, is that you? Then he started screaming. He was screaming that he was sorry for everything. Wakando simply replied, surprise. I'm still alive. She then called the police. Initially, Kalala denied having anything to do with the murder plot. But in addition to the evidence Wakando brought from Burundi, police later wiretapped the phone conversation, which Kalala confessed to his crime. In court, Kalala pleaded guilty to one count of incitement to murder. And what she said is, sometimes the devil can come into somebody's life. But... They can make them do crazy stuff. The husband said he doesn't know why he did that thing. He just wasn't himself. Belinga Kalala was sentenced to nine years in prison with the possibility of parole after six years. Remarkably, Noella Rocundo holds no grudge against her husband 